what I wanted to do today, there's really sort of three parts to what I want to tell you about. One is um, I want to introduce Indigo, who we are. It's, a, it's an exciting company. I think we're novel in, in many respects. We're not novel in that we're a startup. There are a lot of startups in agriculture, which is great, but we're novel in how we're approaching um, things. I want to tell you a little bit about why we think there's a need for companies like Indigo. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about how we're developing products and the results from that work. So Indigo is a very young company. We were founded in 2014. So that makes us, we're just starting our, our third year. We were founded by a, uh, a scientist who had developed a product used, uh, for um, addressing uh, a uh, disease of the stomach and using microbes, using the, the natural gut biome. And he reasoned if reestablishing healthy biome in humans can have such a profound effect on health, perhaps in plants where many of the processes we use in modern ag agriculture may disrupt that normal microbiome, perhaps as an opportunity in agriculture um, to make plants healthier. And if we could do that, uh, that could really have a large effect on, on agriculture, on agricultural sustainability. We are um, about 175 employees. Uh, I think we're a little more than that. We've just opened an office in Yoder, Kansas, which is where uh, this Boston is not, as you know, the center of agriculture, uh, but Kansas is. So we have an office there where our commercial team is, and an office in Memphis, Tennessee, where uh, another part of our commercial team sits. And we're opening some international offices as we as we move into different parts of the globe. And there's an interesting story about Indigo. I, I won't go into it now, but if you do look up, um, if you Google uh, Indigo, as a very very interesting story. It's the it's the plant that gives the blue color to to dungarees, and it, it's produced through a, the microbes in the genus Indigofera. Indigo is, is at the core a company that's trying to do the best science we can. We have a very, very strong scientific advisory board that convenes, reviews what we're doing and how we're doing it and helps guide us to doing the best science to get the best outcomes. And you can see, I think you probably, many of you will recognize the names on this list. So what Indigo is trying to do is ultimately help farmers be more successful and help farmers be more profitable. If farmers are profitable, farmers are going to be able to invest in practices that are sustainable, that allow them to hand their farm down to the next generation and the generation after that. Farmers have not been seeing an increase in their, um, their um, ability to make money on their farms, even though their costs go up every year and there's some very, very high input costs. GM seed, for example, is, uh, is very, very expensive. And farmers are just, they're not seeing the profit from these types of technologies. So we believe that if we can partner with farmers, help farmers be more sustainable financially, then the farmers will have a, a greater opportunity to invest in their farms. And that if these practices can also make healthier plants, and healthier plants can make healthier food, we believe this, this whole cycle is just, is, is, is more sustainable and more beneficial. And so what's going on in agriculture and why are the challenges so, so difficult? Well, we, we're in a, in a very, very uh, rapidly changing world. Agriculture is very, very water intensive and water availability is a, is a crisis in many parts of the world and many parts of the US. So irrigated crops are gonna get more expensive to produce and at some point in time, there won't be water to irrigate crops in areas where there's, there's uh, the aquifers have been depleted. In terms of land, there is less and less land devoted to agriculture globally through the years. But another issue is that the land that is where there is agriculture being practiced, the soil is is becoming degraded, so less nutritious for the plants. And this is a if you if you look at this picture of the of the soil health map across the globe. You can pretty much see everywhere there is major agricultural production, the soils are, are, are badly degraded. And in areas where 
you know, you don't see that is because there's very little agriculture there. So agriculture can be, if not practiced sustainably, can be very, very destructive to soil health. And lastly, as we all know, um, temperature is rising globally. And that's, that is forcing, uh, that, that creates temperature stress for plants. It also increases the need for, for more water. So this is a very, very, oops, excuse me, very, very challenging picture for farmers. And then actually I took these pictures on my flight over yesterday, um, just because I thought it, it illustrates the point very well is a solution is, is not going to be to put more land into agriculture. So this was flying, this is somewhere between Portugal and Spain, and there's not a lot of land there that's not in agricultural production. This was flying over the coast of Italy, and you can, the other point is that, that agriculture can have some very adverse environmental effects. So this is just you know, runoff from the field that's at, that, that is topsoil, which is part of the healthy soil profile, is now in the ocean, so that, that's not gonna make it back on land. And in cases where there's nitrogen in the soil, that, that nitrogen runoff, um, can be very, very toxic, and the example is the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, which is where all the runoff from U.S. agriculture ends up, and where that increased nitrogen increases the, the blooms of algae, and that algae um, basically makes the water uh, you know, low in oxygen and, and essentially toxic. And yet, as we know, with populations rising, we discussed earlier today India and China. These are areas that are not only rising in population, but the demand for, for better quality food or high protein food increases the need for agricultural production and inputs into, into um, protein sources such as poultry, uh, beef, and pork. And so estimate, and this is actually a fairly uh, recent estimate, is that by uh, 2050, there'll need to be a 70% increase in agricultural output to feed the projected population and the projected dietary needs. But I just told you that there's less land in agriculture and the, the, the conditions under which agriculture is being practiced, uh, practiced is, uh, is degrading. And so it's very clear that we need, we need multiple sort of agricultural revolutions to happen. We need to really substantially change how agriculture is, is practiced. And we believe one, one possibility, not the only one, but one is the use of the microbiome. And so we know that of the different agricultural evolutions, revolutions that have happened, some of these have been the result of discoveries in pharma. So one would be the discovery of antibiotics leading to antibiotic use um, on, on farms, such as, as fungicides. And therapeutic biotechnology led to, is the start of GM crops. Well, we believe that another Revolution can happen through understanding the microbiome and 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 uh, optimizing that. So it's, I think it's it's clear to those of us who work in this area that that many many traits in plants are controlled by. We know that they're controlled by the host genome, but as as people refer to the second genome, the microbiome is having a profound effect. Um, if you Imagine that a plant has expresses 30,000 genes, but its biome is expressing half a million genes. It, it's not hard to imagine that, that there's a very strong influence. And to the extent that the microbiome can help plants adapt to and survive different stressors, whether they're disease, insect, competition, um, or environmental, um, we believe we can increase the fitness of, of plants in general without adding additional, without necessarily adding additional inputs. Indigo focuses on endophytes, so these are the microbes that are living within the plant at least some point in their, in their life cycle. And I just, there's, a, I incorporate this slide because it makes an interesting point about, adapt, about stress and the effect of stress on yield. So every year in the United States there are farmers that want to grow the world records yield of, of corn and soybean. And so they, they plant that portion of their field and they baby that part of the field and they make sure there's absolutely no stress whatsoever. And then they get these yields that are you know, over 500 bushels an acre for corn. And it tells you what, that's basically telling you what the genetic potential of the crop is. But the gap between that genetic potential and the average yield that your average farmer gets is due to 
the stresses that are endured during the growing season. In fact, the farmer who won the 2014 world record said plant stress equals yield loss. You either eliminate stress or you address it. And that's what, that's what Indigo was trying to do. We're trying to address stress, stresses in a very, very specific way, which is, is development of an endos symbiome that is, that is uh, helping the plant withstand stress. So that's sort of the, the introduction. Now I want to tell you how we're doing it. So we have a pipeline, um, which is, is uh, I'm sure, no surprise. Our pipeline starts at the isolation of microbes. Then everything goes, we have a very strong bioinformatic engine. And then we make predictions, and then we start testing. We have an iterative feedback where everything we learn goes back into our, into our computational engine, and we're hoping that this allows us through machine learning to make our predictions better and better. And of course, that the vision would be eventually you can select in silico through, through um, genomic information. I, I think the reality will be it's going to help us, but I think we will, as scientists, I like to believe we're always going to need to, uh, to do the, the empirical science. So I'll, I'll, talk, I'll go through uh, each of the stages and just a, a, little, a little bit about each of those uh, to give you a sense of, of um, in, you know, how we actually operate and the processes that have led to the development of, of products. So focus sourcing and isolation is a process by which we can go from a population of plants to individual microbes. And these are the microbes that then would be part of, of the, um, the product that goes back on the plant when we sell the seed. And there can be lots of different hypotheses for the plants you select. It can be plants that look healthy among, amongst plants that maybe don't look as healthy. It can be plants that are surviving in an adverse uh, environment. It can be something as, as uh, um, like a lichen growing on a rock that seems to be existing with no water or nutrient source. Um, anywhere we, there are microbes that may be um, assisting a living organism in its survival and stress mitigation is a great place to look for endophytes. So we collect lots of data. We collect metadata, the GPS coordinates, the plant host, the environmental data, what part of the plant, and that all goes into the, into the database and, and this collection is, is, growing, is growing very rapidly. We also have strains come in uh, through other sources, through, through collaborations, um, and through licenses. And we collect metadata and then, well, we collect, we isolate the microbiomes and then from there the, the single isolates that then go into storage and are, are what go into the further analysis. And this is just an example, of, a real example of a collection that was done in, um, it's even hard to tell what this is, but I think it's soybean, uh, actually this earlier this year. And so we community sequence, so we do surface sterilize. As I said, we're, we work with en um, endophytes, so we surface sterilize the tissue before isolating the microbes from within it. Um, this is just standard. It's you know, taken out of a, a paper many of you have probably read. We start characterizing what we're seeing, and eventually out of this, we go from a, a microbiome in, in a plant to specific microbes that then can, can undergo testing. And, um, this probably just looks pretty familiar to you in terms of the, the, um, the species. And so we, we, before anything goes into the pipeline, there's some computational prediction made around it. So everything has, has 16S ITS sequencing and in the case of bacteria, whole genome. And then we start based on um, any of the data we have collected. It can be the environmental data, the source plant, uh, a, a species, a genus. A hypothesis is generated, it's actually generated, we have a, um, algorithms for generating hypotheses, and that's a set that then goes into testing. And the hypothesis doesn't necessarily have to be, this is going to give me a product out the other end. The hypothesis can be testing uh, many, many different aspects of the biology of the um, micro-plant interaction, but there is a there's a methodology, and then some of them are just put in there because we want to see what happens. But that hypothesis is a hypothesis, which I guess is a lack of a hypothesis, but it's still a hypothesis. There was no underlying information that we had that matched uh, 
any of the other hypotheses that we use, if that makes sense. Um, so we use our own data assets, we use public data, we do a computational screen that the output of that is a, a set for high throughput screening. Um, we also start to understand what types of genes might be enriched in the, plant, in, the, in the microbes that we're isolating through the different sources. And we can, we can learn new things, something that maybe has not been seen before. So then there's a subset. This is sort of a filter, if you want to think of it that way. Then goes through high put, throughput screening. And this is, this is where we're trying to go from thousands of strains, look for some sort of biological signal to get a subset that then we put through further testing. So an example of one of the high throughput screens is, is a seedling assay. So we look at, at you know, root surface area, and these are, this is a real plate from a real assay. This is what the, the analysis looks like, and you can see there are, relative to the non-treated control, there are some that do nothing in this assay, and there are some that have a signal. Um, and this is, a, this is a typical data set. They're, they're always going to be a little noisy, as we all know it's biology. And once we put the microbes on the seed, uh, lots and lots of different things can happen. But this is an example of one of the assays that we use. So then we take, after the high throughput assays, we then take a refined set from that. And again, the selection can be for lots of different purposes. It doesn't have to be just the winners from the assay. But um, the information from the assay then gets fed back into the computational system. So we have it in Boston, the largest conviron growth room in the world. It, it's really, really big. I don't have the dimensions here, but it's, it's, re it's really, really big. And so we can set up very, very large experiments in the growth chamber. We also have uh, industrial growth chain um, greenhouses in the Midwest, so we can take um, I don't have the number of, of microbes that we can put through testing through the greenhouse and the, um, the growth chamber, but um, we can control, excuse me, a very high uh, degree of, of precision for controlling temperature, humidity, water. Um, we can impose heat stress, salt stress, water stress, no stress, um, and then analyze any of, the, any of the parameters. It also is a very useful place for us to look at how we formulate the microbe. So we try to, we try to simulate the, what a uh, farm uses in terms of how the microbes are applied to the seed. So we're, we're replicating a commercial, to the best of our ability, what would happen in a commercial setting. So this is just an example of a couple of the, of the assays. So you can see you get a, a, a range of effects uh, from negative to, uh, to positive, and this is, um, the Bayesian analysis. This is just saying that, you know, what percent of the effect we're seeing is due to the treatment, in this case the, the microbe. And it's, it's hard to see uh, in the picture, but, but these are the results. Um, and this is just another example of tillering in wheat. And you can see that this one actually you can see visually. Um, I don't know which strain um, that is here, but, but we can get, um, we can get reproducible results in, in the growth chamber, and then this allows us to take a subset that we think are, are good performers and put them out into the field. And so we have a field trial program that, where we test in all the areas that we plan to commercialize in. And so that's, I don't know the number of sites in the U.S., but it's every state that, that we would be um, launching products in. So this is just, uh, I have three examples of what the entire process looks like from start to finish. Um, so in a particular case, um, and this is in um, cotton, we have the comparison between treated and untreated in the lab, in the greenhouse, and then you can see in the field. So that's treated, that's untreated, and it's actually visually a, a very, very strong phenotype. In the case of wheat, we had seen some very, very strong results in the lab replicated in the growth chamber. And although this is a very young field, I think you can see that the treated has a, uh, they're just more biomass at this point in the season than the untreated. And then the last example is soybean. And you can see that there was visually a, a difference in, in root mass. We had a strong phenotype and drought resistance. And then, I apologize for how hard this is to see, but the front part of this field is untreated, 
and the back part of it is, is treated. And again, you can see a strong uh, phenotype in the field. That is not to say that everything that shows an effect in the lab or in the growth chamber is going to give us uh, that strong a phenotype in the field. And that phenotype in the field does not necessarily translate into, in, into increased yield, which is what the farmer sells. He sells yield, not, not greener plants. And so these are all very positive indications, but there's still a, quite a big step before something can become a commercial product. And so, you know, it's interesting when you talk to farmers about what do they, who do they believe, what do they want to see before they're willing to take a chance on a new technology. And farmers will tell you, I'll listen to other farmers. I don't think field trials that are done by, you know, companies or academics are particularly informative. And we heard that loud and clear. So we established a, um, pro a um, we established this group of Indigo partners, and these are farmers, they're commercial farmers who are willing to partner with us and test our microbes on portions of their field. So these aren't, you know, split plot replicated field trials. These are actually strip trials in their field. They harvest this as if it was their own crop and they, they can sell the product off it. But they're willing to give us feedback on, on, these, um, on these treatments that we're, um, that we're ultimately selling. So it's a council of growers. They are growers that work with other growers. And this year we'll have about 10,000 acres um, on all five of the crops we work with in the Midwest that will be, that will be managed by these, these partners. We also have things in commercial growth where it's not the partners, but this has become a, a very, very valuable form of testing for indigo. And this is just, this is on our, our website, but it basically is, um, you know, these are fields where we can go take a lot of data back into the lab, into our computational um, engine. And so then the last step, of course, which is why we're, we're in this business at all, is, is commercialization. And so we have a sales force that is working with farmers. Our top candidates are, are launched. We had a uh, 2016, at, as our, in our second year in business, we launched a product in cotton and a product in wheat. And this year we have additional products in soy, corn, and rice. Um, we have, um, as part of our, our agreement with the growers, we give agronomic advice. Um, and we also are, are able to go onto their, their farms and collect environmental and agronomic data and also have farm advisors available to the farmers to help them maximize uh, all of the decisions that, that, you know, this probably, I mean, there's, a, there's thousands of decisions a farmer makes on his farm throughout a growing season, and we're trying to help with that in addition to the product. So the last few slides I wanted to go through um, talking about our one of our commercial launches. Um, this is from 2016. So it's sort of a, a case study, uh, if you will. So we had one of our um, scientific advisory board members is also an early collaborator with Indigo. So Greg sort of Texas A&M had gone out into a cotton field after the 2011 drought. And I don't know if in Italy people were aware of how severe the drought was, but farmers were losing their cattle. Um, it, it was the worst, one of the worst droughts in recorded history in Texas. And so he went out um, into a, uh, a grower's trial where the cotton was growing and he looked at the plants that were, were looking really good and isolated the microbes from them and went through a pipeline similar to what, what I just showed you. Um, and then in partnership with us, we started testing on, um, com at commercial scale and one of those endophytes looked very, very promising and that was our first, the first product we launched. So we launched it in five states. I'm just showing you four of the five. I don't know why the fifth state isn't on this slide. And then just as an example, so you know, this isn't a magic bullet. The results, the, the data are gonna be variable. Uh, no two fields look the same. Um, but on, when, we, when we looked at a field by field level um, of all the same cotton variety with the same microbe on it, this was an example of, of the results. So not, not every field was positive, but some were, were highly positive where, you know, on a, um, you know, an 800 plus pounds of lint basis, which is a, is a pretty good yield of cotton. Um, there were farm, there were fields that had a, almost a 50% increase in yield. So this year we also 
harvested our, our first commercial launch of wheat. So wheat stays in the ground almost a year. And so we just harvested. We're actually just looking at the data. So this is not a, uh, this is not the final data, but from um, the fields that were harvested where we could do the analysis, we see in the high stress conditions, we see some very, very nice performance of the, the micro-treated seed relative to untreated. And even in the areas where the yields were higher, so the higher yield indicates relative lack of stress compared to yields at 30 or 40 bushels, um, there are still cases where, where we see a significant yield increase through the micro-treatment. Although unquestionably, the greatest effect was on the areas uh, where there was environmental stress. So as we're developing our pipeline, we're moving from, uh, I mean not moving, we're continuing to work on abiotic stresses, so salt, heat, water, and nutrient stress, and we're starting to expand into disease control, insect protection, and nematode control. So these are all things that are, that are very challenging for farmers. And plants that are unhealthy due to other stresses such as water, heat, or salt, are also more susceptible to some of the other biotic stresses. And this is just, we're just getting this underway. Um, so that was actually my last slide, and it's, it's um, I think, I just want to close with that I think indigo is, be, is, is innovative um, in, in many, many respects. I think we're, it's not only the, the science, and I think the area of, of microbes for agriculture is extremely exciting. And um, I think there's a, just a ton of great science yet to be done. But our approach to, to agriculture and working with farmers, I think, is also innovative. And we're hoping is going to be a way to get this technology out um, in as many, as many farmers' fields as possible. And that's my last slide.